in the headlines of this hour on VTV News. State President Receives Russian Ambassador And National Assembly Deputies Look Into Draft Laws In our world news, Israeli Prime Minister dissolves War Cabinet. Broadcasting from Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam, VTV News starts right now. Good morning, it is 8 a.m. local time in Hanoi, and you're watching VTV News. I'm Huyen Tân with the top stories. Russian President Vladimir Putin will pay a state visit to Vietnam from June 19th to the 20th, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has just announced. The visit will be made at the invitation of the General Secretary of the Communist Party of Vietnam's Central Committee, Nguyen Phu Tham. State President Tô Lâm received Russian Ambassador to Vietnam Gennady Bezdeko at the Presidential Palace on Monday morning. The State President affirmed that Vietnam consistently regards Russia as its top priority and a reliable partner in our foreign policy. He also spoke highly of recent positive developments in the long-standing friendship and comprehensive strategic partnership between Vietnam and Russia. The Vietnamese state leader believes that there is still great potential for enhancing cooperation, and he trusts that through existing bilateral mechanisms, the strategic partnership between Vietnam and Russia will continue to be strengthened further in the future. For his part, Russian Ambassador Gennady Bezdeko congratulated State President Tô Lâm on being chosen by the party, state and people of Vietnam for his new mission. He expressed his desire to promote bilateral relations in various areas, including economics and trade, defense and security, education and training, science and technology, tourism, and people-to-people -people exchanges. National Assembly deputies have stressed the need for education in areas with high ethnic populations and mountainous areas. This was discussed at the National Assembly's ongoing 7th plenary session on Monday concerning national target program investment policy adjustments for socio-economic development in these areas for the 2021 to 2030 period. In order to remove obstacles and speed up the disbursement progress of projects and subprojects listed as parts of the National Target Program for Socioeconomic Development in ethnic group inhabited and mountainous areas in the 2021 to 2030 period, National Assembly deputies agreed it was necessary to adjust investment policies. I highly appreciate and would like to express my full support to the decision to expand the list of the program's beneficiaries. The program should focus on four groups of beneficiaries, including 10 public service units, 101 ethnic boarding schools in 39 provinces, and three medical centers and district hospitals. Currently, the majority of vocational education institutions as well as educational institutions listed in the program are located in districts, which are not in the ethnic group inhabited and mountainous areas. I say we should put more centers for continuing education and centers for vocational education into operation in these remote areas. Many deputies also suggested giving localities more authorization related to this matter. We should consider adjusting targets, goals, and roadmaps to implement the program's goals in a way that allows localities to select component projects with urgent investment needs. They then can have full authorization to direct investment into those areas. My point is, we should consider giving localities more authorization related to this matter. Legislators stressed that the adjustments are necessary to address difficulties and obstacles to the implementation work thus accelerating the disbursement towards achieving the program's targets set in the National Assembly's resolutions. Also on Monday morning, National Assembly deputies discussed the investment policy of the North-South Expressway construction project. Legislators recommended reviewing the process in compliance with planning, transparency and publicity in land acquisition, compensation and resettlement support. 
On Monday afternoon, after hearing proposal and verification reports on the draft revised notary law and the draft amended law on value-added tax, or VAT, National Assembly deputies discussed the bills in groups and the National Assembly's draft resolution on value-added tax, or VAT, reduction. More in the following. Giving opinions on the draft revised notary law, many deputies suggested adding contents to clearly stipulate the interpreter's responsibility for the accuracy of the translation with the original. The notary must be held responsible for the authenticity and legality of the translated document to be notarized. The notaries themselves have different levels of foreign language proficiency, same as their team of collaborators to help with translation. Therefore, the accuracy of these translations are sometimes questionable. My proposal is to amend the authorization of notaries. The notaries can only authenticate the translator's signature. There is no content in the draft law stipulating what conditions must be met for notary practice organizations to receive internships. Therefore, it is recommended that the agency in charge of drafting the law shall consider specific regulations on notary practice organizations that are eligible to receive internships. Regarding the draft amended law on value-added tax and tax rates for goods and services of business households and individuals with monthly revenue, many delegates suggested assessing the impact of this regulation. The overall sentiment held that there must be regulations on the taxable amount for such goods and services. In my opinion, we should consider adding this content. For those whose monthly revenues are below 2,000 US dollars are not subject to tax. This will better support individuals and small business households. Point B, Clause 1, Article 14 stipulates this for goods that are deductible on the basis that they are subject to added service tax. But for agricultural products that are not subject to value-added tax, why are they deductible? During the session, Deputies also gave their opinions on the National Assembly's draft resolution stipulating the reduction of value-added tax. Chairman of the National Assembly Chen Tengmen hosted a reception for EU Ambassador Julian Guerrier and other EU diplomats to Vietnam on a Monday. At the meeting, Chairman Chen Tengmen hoped for a continued close coordination between the Vietnamese National Assembly and the European Parliament, particularly in exchanging parliamentary experiences and effectively implementing the EVFTA, benefiting both peoples and enterprises. He also expressed hope that the European Commission would remove its yellow card on Vietnamese seafood. The European side expressed a desire to enhance collaboration with Vietnam in maritime security, compliance with international law, and addressing non-traditional challenges like cybersecurity, affirming coordination to promote the removal of the IUU yellow card on Vietnamese seafood. Now, in May, Vietnam recorded its first trade deficit in two years following a continuous period of trade surplus. The export figure for May reached the lowest level compared to the 8 billion US dollars trade surplus from the beginning of the year. However, there are positive signs as businesses are increasingly importing raw materials and fuels for the booming year end orders. This sportswear business has had orders to the US and Europe market lined up till the end of the year. The company has to import 20% more woven fabric which is yet to be produced domestically, to ensure the production. This year orders surpassed 15 to 20 percent our company's capacity. As a result, we have to import raw materials such as fabric from China, Korea and some other Asian countries. According to the statistics office, May's trade deficit is driven by a sharp increase in imports of equipment, machinery, and raw materials for production. Businesses in electronics and computer components phone components, textiles, leather, and footwear are preparing production for orders in the second half of this year. China remains Vietnam's largest import market for production materials, with the trade deficit from this country reaching over 32 billion US dollars in the past five months, an increase of over 55 percent compared to the same period. The upward trend in importing machinery and equipment from other countries, such as ASEAN and South Korea, also contributed to the increase in imports. We are planning to increase our monthly capacity from 2 to 4 million products, 
therefore we imported machines to meet this year's production target. These machines are of high quality, meeting the standards of our customers. This may recorded a trade deficit of 500 million US dollars. It is driven by an increase in imports of equipment, machinery, and raw materials, which is a sign of positive recovery for production. The large amount of imports of raw materials also pushed the total import and export turnover of goods in the past five months up by over 22% compared to the same period last year. It contributes to the goal of a 6% import and export turnover growth rate set for this year. Vietnam's annual fruit output ranges from 14 to 17 million tons, but the price immediately drops when a certain type of fruit is in season with a high crop yield. One solution to mitigate this phenomenon besides improving a fruit product's quality and competitive edge is to promote processing and expand consumption channels. Our next story in the South Central region's largest mango growing area offers a glimpse into this endeavor. Farmers in the Cam Lam Mango region, Khánh Hòa province, are familiar with mango prices falling by half in the harvest season. This year, mangoes sold to China under unofficial quotas decrease compared to usuals. In the face of this challenge, Hòa opened a mango girdle cake facility to share the farmer's burden of seeking consumption output. As a tech-savvy person, Hòa applied technologies in all production stages to ensure food safety and eye-catching packages for the finished products. A kilogram of mango girdle cake is made from 10 kilograms of mango. During the peak season, we make 10 tons of cake, which means we have consumed 100 tons of fresh mangoes from the farmers. More importantly, mangoes are also highly valued. 10 kilograms of mangoes sometimes only cost 2 US dollars, but after being processed, this amount of mango can be valued at up to 11 US dollars. Processed mango products are also sold on diverse consumption channels, including e-commerce platforms, social networks, and tours. Promoting our products on e-commerce platforms, social networks, and via press agency is crucial. Through these channels, we can introduce Gamla Mango products to a wider customer base. We will try to cooperate with travel agencies to include trips to mango gardens in tourist itineraries, thereby expanding consumption channels. Spanning 7,000 hectares, Gamlam is the largest mango growing area in the South Central region. Diversifying product types and consumption channels allows local farmers to reduce the region's food price drop during the harvest season. Coming up next on VTV News. Local authorities ensure freedom of religious activities for ethnic believers in Duck Lak province. And festival introducing a Vietnamese culture launched in France. Welcome back to VTV News. Now, efforts to combat illegal, unreported and unregulated or IUU fishing or IUU seafood exploitation have recently achieved significant progress. To ensure the best results for the upcoming European Commission or EC inspection, Deputy Prime Minister Chen Lu Guang chaired a meeting of the National Steering Committee on IUU on Monday afternoon. He emphasized that the period from now until September when the EC is expected to conduct its fifth inspection is a crucial opportunity for Vietnam to address shortcomings in IUU implementation. He proposed fully utilizing Resolution 04, which provides instruction for applying a certain provision of the Penal Code regarding criminal prosecution for IUU violations. This will demonstrate Vietnam's concrete and decisive actions in lifting the yellow card. 
and restructuring the fisheries sector to be transparent, responsible and sustainable. In recent years, the religious activities of Protestants in the Central Highlands provinces have been incredibly vibrant. The state, through authorities at all levels, provides favorable conditions for lawful pastoral activities in villages. The close attention of the party and state has created favorable conditions through practical policies for people to exercise their rights, thereby contributing to socio-economic development. Join us in the following story in the Gukun district, Naklak province, where a terrorist attack occurred one year ago to discover more. Member of Yabung Village, Protestant Association of Yatio Commune, Kukuin districts have a new and spacious place for their religious activities. This year, the village has a new place to worship. We are so happy. Thank God for giving the village a church. Thank the leaders for their help in building a place for us to worship. I am very happy. In 2008, the Evangelical Association of Ebum Village was recognized by the state as legal entity. Since then, local authorities have created good conditions for the association to build four religious points. We have been very excited and happy. Religious activities are facilitated by the state without any difficulties for us to practice. Every time there is a big event and we invite the commune and district authorities, they come and join us. We really appreciate the attention. We have been offered great conditions. Everyone is very happy. Based on the actual situation according to the provisions of religious and land laws, the Commune People's Committee also considers creating favorable conditions for us. We live obeying the laws, contributing to economic development, and protecting national security. Locals are also guided in retreatering group activity and developing followers. These legalized groups are supported in training classes for dignitaries and publishing scriptures. Local authorities protect and respect our beliefs. The development of our association has been really good. The party and state take care and create the best conditions for the church. Daglak province has about 200,000 Protestants, of which 97% are ethnic people. They have contributed to building a stable, prosperous and strong Daglak province. Hayo District, Namdik Province is one of the first grassroots localities to respond to the Prime Minister's call for organ and tissue donation registration. On Sunday, hundreds of residents registered for organ, tissue and cornea donation. They believe sharing is caring. Thousands more have registered online. It is estimated that Vietnam has over 300,000 blind individuals due to corneal diseases and they can only regain their sight through a corneal transplant surgeries. Vietnam Airlines has inaugurated a route between Vietnam and the Philippines, making it the first Vietnamese carrier to establish a direct connection to the island nation. The national carrier will operate a seven flights a week between the two Southeast Asian countries, four on the Ho Chi Minh City Manila route and the remainder on the Hanoi Manila one. The Vietnam Airlines launch of direct flights is a sign of a growing strategic partnership between the two countries, with many opportunities for both to increase tourism and trade. This annual EC Vietnam Festival has attracted a large number of participants in the capital city of Paris. Most notably, this year's event is organized by Vietnamese people born and raised in France with the goal of keeping and promoting their Vietnamese identity. This in the following story. Monkey Square, nested in the heart of Paris, is bustling with people attending the festival. This district is dense with several large universities such as Sorbonne and medical universities, as well as French research institutes. As a result, participants were not just passers-by, but came specifically to learn about Vietnam. Although I'm from a nearby Southeast Asian country, I don't have many opportunities to learn about Vietnam, so I came here to explore its culture. Cuisine and literature was the main theme of this year's inaugural event. 
25 Vietnamese restaurants in Paris have participated, bringing cuisine from different Vietnamese regions. It also highlighted the differences between Vietnamese cuisine and neighboring Asian countries. Additionally, an event introducing Vietnamese books also attracted the public's attention. We are motivated to introduce Vietnam to the world and bring about emotions through the exchanges in literature, contemporary art, or cinema. This connection is crucial for creators who are influenced and nurtured by Vietnamese culture. We also diversify the activities, cuisine and literature for this event, while cinema, painting and art are set for others. In addition, a Vietnamese film week will be held this October. These events are contributing to introducing the culture and creativity of the Vietnamese community to the world. Mu Cang Thai district in Yên Bái province isn't only renowned for its golden season of ripe rice from September to October. It also captivates tourists with the beauty of its terrace fields during the rainy season. Currently, the Hmong people in Mu Cang Thai are busy with farm work in anticipation of the new crop. Their traditional farming methods have transformed the terrace fields into a must-visit destination for those eager to experience the local nature and culture. After allowing the lawn to rest for three months, Tao Aka began blocking the field. I take advantage of the rain to plow. The land is dry and cannot be plowed when it's sunny. When water is available, we can grow our crops. In Pao Khat village, rains arrive early, prompting villagers to plant rice seedlings in the fields. The water colors blend with the brown soil and the green rice seedlings. During this season, villagers work in traditional customs, which Dang they hopes to capture and share with tourists. We aim for visitors to grasp our culture fully. To achieve this, they must experience it firsthand. Daniel visited Mu Kang Chai during the water powering season. He was amazed by the locals' English explanations to the terrace fields. He got hands-on blocking experience. Follow me, I will show you the, how to use the machine. Mm -hmm. We tried a little bit to work. I think it's a hard job. Uh, especially if you do every day like, like they do. It's satisfying to, to harvest, to collect what uh, you work for many months. In addition to farming for food security, we utilize the landscape to offer additional tourism services. The beauty of Terence fields during the water pouring season has become a captivating tourism attraction, driving socio-economic development in the locality. Coming up next in our world news, Israeli Prime Minister dissolves War Cabinet. And Ukraine Peace Summit achieves few results. Now moving on to our world news, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has dissolved the six-member war cabinet. It was formed after the start of Israel-Hamas conflict in October 2023. This widely expected move came after the centrist former General Benny Gantz left his position in government on June 9. The Prime Minister is now expected to hold consultations about the Gaza conflict with a small group of ministers. He had faced demands from the nationalist religious partners in his coalition, the finance minister and national security minister, to be included in the war cabinet. This move would have intensified strains with international partners, including the United States. These partners have taken a hard line on reaching a ceasefire agreement with Hamas. A meeting on peace in Ukraine held in Switzerland ended with few achievements. Heads of state or their representatives from more than 90 countries attended the event. Russian and Chinese leaders were absent from the conference. Although some controversial issues were dropped, not all attendees backed the summit's closing a document. These include Saudi Arabia, India, South Africa, Thailand, Indonesia, Mexico, and the United Arab Emirates. Russia noted the limited results of the summit due to the absence of Russia. 
According to Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, Russia is ready for dialogue with all countries that intend to negotiate. Earlier, President Vladimir Putin announced that Russia was ready to end the conflict if Ukraine agreed to drop its NATO membership ambitions and hand over four provinces claimed by Russia. Kiev rejected this request. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has welcomed Chinese Premier Li Chang to the Australian Parliament in Canberra for high-level talks that both sides described as candid. The two leaders witnessed the signing of a series of bilateral agreements to renew dialogue and strengthen cooperation between Australia and China. Ministers from the two countries signed memorandums of understanding to strengthen the implementation of the China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, Education and Research Cooperation. The Chinese Premier says China will include Australia in the list of unilateral visa free country. China is currently Australia's largest trading partner. <laughs> European Union countries approved a flagship policy to restore damaged nature on Monday after months of delay. This approval makes it the first green law to pass since European Parliament election this month. More to follow. The Nature Restoration Law is among the EU's biggest environmental policies, requiring member states to introduce measures restoring nature on a fifth of their land and sea by 2030. EU countries' environment ministers backed the policy at a meeting in Luxembourg, meaning it can now pass into law. The vote was held after Austria's environment minister defied her conservative coalition partners by pledging to back the policy. I'm deeply convinced that today is the day for action and that today is the time to adopt the nature restoration legislation. That's why Austria will support the law in today's vote in the Council. EU countries and the European Parliament negotiated a deal on the law last year, but it has come under fire from some governments in recent months amid protests by farmers angry at costly EU regulations. This is a voluntary law in the sense of the measures that may have to be taken will not be enforced or imposed on any farmer or forester. And in my mind, it is a real opportunity to answer what the farmers are protesting about, particularly the most marginal farmers in our union, that they need a fair income for protecting nature. And for that second reason, I believe we should approve the law here today. The policy aims to reverse the decline of Europe's natural habitats, 81% of which are classed as being in poor health and include specific targets, for example to restore peatlands so they can absorb CO2 emissions. Now let's move on to the weather forecast. And that's all the news we have for this hour. To rewatch our program, you can download our mobile app at VTV Go or check out our YouTube channel, VTV for Go. Thank you for watching and see you next time.